It's my, it's my pleasure to introduce you tonight to uh, Professor Sophia Rust, who is the Frederick S. Danziger Associate Professor in the History of Science at Harvard University here. Her research focuses on the 20th and 21st century life sciences, examining how biology is changing at the moment when researchers build new biological systems in order to investigate how biology actually works. Professor Rouge received her PhD in 2010 from MIT in the program of History, Anthropology, and Science, Technology, and Society at MIT, as I said. She is the author of numerous articles and essays and the recipient of several prestigious fellowships, including the Anna Maria Kellen Fellowship of the American Academy in Berlin and the Joy Foundation Fellowship of the Radcliffe Institute from, uh, for Advanced Studies. Her first book, Synthetic, Synthetic, Our Life Got Made, published by the University of Chicago Press this year, and of which we will learn more tonight, looks at how synthetic biologists make new living things in order to understand better how life works. As a cultural anthropologist, Professor Rouge documents the social, cultural, rhetorical, economic, and imaginative transformation that biology has undergone in the post-genomic age. The production of this work led her to a variety of places, including university research labs, uh, conferences, startups, and hackers' garage. The book tells the origin story of, a, of an astonishing claim that biological making fosters biological knowing. On a personal note, reading Sophia's uh, scholarly publications provided me with a new insight in contemporary context when enjoying, on my way to work, prize-winning works of fiction, such as Margaret Atwood's Mad Adam trilogy, Jeff Van Der Meer's The Southern Reach trilogy, and Paolo Bacigalupi's The Wind Up Girl. The dystopian universes created by these science fiction authors seem sometimes to strike a little bit too close to home. Knowledge is power, as we are often told. Let us hope Professor Rouge will continue to write books to save us all. Without further ado, please welcome with me a rising star in our field, Professor Sophia Rust. So thank you, uh, Jean-Francois, for that very generous introduction. And we should talk more about sci-fi on another night. Um, and thank you all for coming this evening to, to hear about synthetic biology. Historians and Ecclesiastes be damned. In the first decades of the 21st century, a number of things are new under the sun. Living things bearing genomes pared down, streamlined, or cobbled together from bits of synthesized DNA now scurry, swim, and flourish in test tubes and glass bioreactors. These include creatures as unlikely as viruses named for computer software, bacteria encoding passages of James Joyce, and chimeric yeast buckling under the combined strain of genes harvested from sweet wormwood, petunias, and Icelandic microbes. My first book, Synthetic, How Life Got Made, is an anthropological account of synthetic biologists, the people who are manufacturing these novel organisms. I spent eight years ethnographically studying this community of scientists beginning in 2005. And the book ranges from synthetic biologists' efforts to build bespoke viruses, to corporate efforts to engineer biofuels, to so-called biohackers who conduct bioengineering experiments in their homes. However, this evening, I want to focus on an early and ongoing effort by synthetic biologists to, as they put it, revive or resurrect extinct species. The reason I choose to focus on this research is because I see it as metonymic of synthetic biology at large. What I mean by that is it projects science fictional extremes and yet also responds to and includes many of the core questions at the heart of synthetic biology. So what is the difference between creation and design? What is the difference between purity and hybridity? What is the difference between the natural and the synthetic? At stake, I contend, is whether there are now new answers to old questions, such as what is life and what is a species? <laughs> 
But first, a bit of explanation is in order. Who are synthetic biologists, and what business do I have studying them? And for that matter, why? As a historian and anthropologist of science, I use the same tools and methods as other cultural anthropologists. However, unlike other cultural anthropologists, I train my attention on scientific culture and practice, and in particular, biotechnology and bioengineering in the last 20 years, which happens to be a very exciting time to be studying the life sciences, because biology is not what it used to be. And when I say biology, I mean both the discipline of biology, but also biological stuff. It's not what it used to be. So since the advent of biology as a professional field at the end of the 19th century, life science has primarily been an experimental venture. That is, it tends to involve deductive reasoning of the kind of you know, scientific hypothesis um, that uh, many of us learned in high school, although in many ways it diverges from that. Biologists have inquired into the structure and function of life using laboratory and field research, so taking organisms apart. This is still how much biological work gets done, but in the last years of the 20th century, emigres from mechanical and electrical engineering and computer science resolved that if the aim of biology was to understand how life works, then manufacturing life would yield better theories than would experimentation. So here I'm talking about not taking things apart, but rather putting together new things as a way of producing new kinds of knowledge about life. They advocated not experiment, but manufacture, not reduction, but construction, not analysis, but synthesis. New biotechnology techniques, notably faster and cheaper DNA sequencing and synthesis, have aided them in their efforts. And um, by sequencing and synthesis, what I mean is the ability to read strings of genetic nucleotides. You probably remember A, C, T, and G, uh, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine from school. Um, so taking physical models of, um, er, sorry, physical molecules and then reading them into code and then uh, doing the reverse for uh, synthesis. So, uh, right, uh, to sequence a genome, you start with the physical material here. This is like a lizard, I guess, I don't know. Uh, and then you uh, turn it into digital information and then synthesis does the reverse. You start with the digital information and then you uh, use a DNA synthesizer to turn it into a physical molecule to order. So using these tools, synthetic biologists treat biological media as a substrate for manufacture. In fact, I heard many of them say often, uh, you know, what's the difference between building uh, a cell and building a bridge? Or what's the difference between writing computer software and writing the genome, things like that. But like I said earlier, in my remaining time, I wanna focus on how these developments play out in one subset of synthetic biology in which synthetic biologists seek to use DNA synthesis to, as they put it, resurrect extinct organisms. They've trained their sights on creatures like woolly mammoths, passenger pigeons, and even Neanderthals. In examining de-extinction efforts, I care about how synthetic biologists think about what a species becomes if it can be brought back from the dead. And I seek to make sense of how they think about how lost species are transformed into synthetic life forms to come. I want to emphasize in particular that I'm not interested in offering any kind of definition of what life is, nor what a species is. What I mean by that is cultural anthropologist bread and butter is taking seemingly natural categories and then demonstrating how they're socially constituted and historically specific. So cultural anthropologists have done this famously for categories like gender and race, showing that they are not themselves natural categories. And even the category of the natural itself is not a natural category. More recently, historians and anthropologists have also begun placing species under the similar definitional pressure. And here I'm relying on a lot of literature, um, including the work of historians of science Hans-Jörg Reinberger, 
uh, as well as Harriet Ritvo and anthropologists like Sarah Franklin, uh, Stefan Helmreich, and Donna Haraway. I aim to chart how new configurations of technology and social practices together impact the way we think about, the way we talk about, and how we act upon categories such as, and here I'm gonna get tired of making scare quotes, so when I say life and when I say species, just hear the air quotes, okay? So let me begin with three stories about resurrection. Here's the first one. Michael Archer, a paleontologist at the University of New South Wales, tells me the strange tale of the gastric brooding frog. The gastric brooding frog's name explains exactly what it is, or what it was, or what it might soon someday be. And here the tenses are already getting complicated, which is worth paying attention to. The gastric brooding frog is so named because, as you guessed, or, or could tell from the photo, it once birthed live frogs from its mouth. Discovered in 1972, by the mid-1980s, the gastric brooding frog was extinct, felled by a rogue fungus. But Michael Archer obsessed over reviving the gastric brooding frog after he learned that a nearby professor at the University of Adelaide had been the last researcher to keep a colony of these frogs in his laboratory. And as it turned out, there was a jar of frozen tissue, frog tissue, that had been stashed in a negative 20 degrees Celsius freezer in Adelaide for over 40 years. So Archer resolved to make use of what's called somatic cell nuclear transfer, or SCNT, and I'll say a lot more about SCNT soon, uh, but to use this technology um, in order to resurrect the gastric brooding frog. And I should say SCNT is the same technology that was used um, to clone Dolly the sheep. She's not actually a clone, uh, which has to do with the relationship between nuclear DNA and mitochondrial DNA. I won't go into that, but let's just call it cloning for now. Okay, so SCNT, and this is the, the biology portion of the evening, is a technology in which an entire adult cell from one animal is inserted into an egg that has been enucleated. So in the case of Dolly the sheep, they took mammalian cells from one sheep, and then uh, when I say enucleated, that means they just take the nucleus out of the egg from another sheep, and then they insert the genetic material from the first sheep into the enucleated egg, um, and then, as you can tell, they use um, uh, electricity in order to cause the cell to fuse, and then insert the um, embryo after it is divided in a Petri dish into a third surrogate uh, sheep in order to bring it to term. So <clears throat> there's a timeline that I want to show you of um, some of the notable moments in somatic cell nuclear transfer and related artificial reproductive technologies. These have actually been going on much longer uh, than this chart shows. We can track artificial parthenogenesis back to the teens. Um, but some of the early work uh, you might note is um, using artificial technology to uh, recreate a mouse in 1970, uh, then Dolly the Sheep in 1996, and uh, after that a number of SCNT uh, uh, projects resulted in a number of new organisms, including uh, the Gower, which I'm going to talk about momentarily, as well as human embryos. Uh, and that leads us up to uh, close to the present with both human stem cells and the woolly mammoth, which I'll also talk about. So usually in somatic cell nuclear transfer, um, the nucleus and the egg come from the same species, right? Different organisms with the same species, as in the case of Dolly the sheep, they're both sheep. Different kinds of sheep, but sheep. Um, and this is also true of a few of the other um, more famous examples of SCNT, uh, including uh, 2005 Snuppy the Dog, um, Second Chance the Bull, and I'd be happy to talk all about Second Chance the Bull uh, in the Q&A if anyone's even remotely interested, um, as well as the uh, famous South Korean coyotes. There's a pack of coyote clones, uh, although I don't think they got names. Okay, but Archer did something different. So 
he introduced genetic material from the extinct species of gastric brooding frog into the egg of a related but still different living species. That is, he introduced the previously frozen gastric brooding frog nuclei into host eggs of a related frog called the barred frog. And to his astonishment, his team took turns staring into a microscope, observing embryos divide. While there was no reason, he recalled, to think that a, quote, dead nucleus would take hold in a live species, as he put it, I saw a miracle starting to happen. One of the eggs began to divide again and again, and these live cells contained the nucleic DNA of a previously extinct species. Now, I should say that none of these cells successfully reached the blastocyst stage or differentiated. Um, so this is, blastocyst stage is right before uh, something turns into an embryo. Um, and these cells died long before a viable frog could have ever hatched. Uh, despite that setback, Archer exulted in a flourish of Judeo-Christian overreach. We are watching Lazarus rise from the dead, step by hopping step. Um, <laughs> No gastric brooding frogs have hopped uh, since 1972, as far as I know. Okay. So here's story number two. While the gastric brooding frog cells died while still in a petri dish, Robert Lanza, a researcher at Advanced Cell Technology, describes the first instance of interspecies somatic cell nuclear transfer that resulted in a live birth. An endangered Southeast Asian wild ox called a gower was born in Sioux Center, Iowa in January of 2001. Researchers mailed frozen gower embryos to a farm in Iowa where several unassuming cows were slated to be impregnated. There were a few false starts. So for example, FedEx forgot to pick up the package of frozen gower embryos and they had thawed the following morning. Uh, yeah, it's gross. Um, but eventually, farmers were able to artificially inseminate four cows with embryos made by inserting, again, in the same way as the gastric breeding frog, inserting gower nuclei into cow eggs. And of the four resulting pregnancies, one cow, whose name was Bessie, birthed a live gower. Now, Robert Lanza admitted that the gower, named Noah, lived only two days his official cause of death was dysentery. But despite that, uh, what I want to ask is, what are we to make of Noah, the dead Iowan Gower? I think Lanza's story expresses anxieties over genetically mixing species. One way to put it from an anthropological perspective is that interspecies SCNT, that is moving genetic material, from one often either endangered or extinct species into the sex cell of another species upsets notions of biological relatedness by drawing together organisms that are classed as too different. So anthropologists have long studied kinship and as an anthropologist, I like to turn to kinship as uh, a way of making sense of things. And uh, for anthropologists, when you look at kinship, it's about sorting out how different cultures think about who could or should be related to whom and why. But extending cultural kinship into biological relatedness, uh, one anthropologist named Sarah Franklin has pointed out that cloning, in the case of Dolly the sheep, is a taboo form of reproduction because it involves what she describes as, quote, too much kinship. Extending this claim, I would suggest that interspecies somatic cell nuclear transfer and surrogacy is an illicit example of not enough kinship. It's a sort of illegitimate and artificial procreation across species boundaries. So this is my third story. Alberto Fernandez Arias, head of the Hunting, Fishing, and Wetlands Department in Aragon, Spain, chronicles another only marginally successful resurrection tale. As journalist Carl Zimmer introduced it, on July 30th, 2003, a team of Spanish and French scientists reversed time. In the Ordesa and Monte Perdido National Park, running along the border of France and Spain, 
a Pyrenean ibex known as the Bucardo dwindled in the late 20th century, a victim of European hunters. And on January 6, 2000, the last female Bucardo named Celia was crushed under a falling tree, thereby rendering her species extinct. Weirdly, when I talk about this story, people tend to laugh. I don't know if it's the image or just people have a sick sense of humor. Um, okay, so Celia gets hit by a tree and researchers discovered her mangled body after her tracking collar set off a mortality alarm, which is triggered when animals stop moving. However, 10 months earlier, Fernandez Arias had taken a tissue sample from Celia and frozen it. In the months that followed her death, a team of scientists from Aragon performed a series of interspecies embryo transfers. What they did was they first mated Spanish ibexes to domestic goats to produce several hybrid ibex goat females. They then took 154 uh, Bucardo nuclei, all of which were cloned from Celia, and they put those um, uh, Bucardo nuclei into enucleated goat eggs. So just to clarify, we have a, a suite of surrogate goat ibex females that are about to be impregnated. We have cells that have the uh, Bucardo nuclei inside of a goat egg. And then once they have those uh, eggs, they implant the chimeric embryos into 44 of the hybrid surrogates. Only one Bucardo was carried to term and born in July of 2003. The Bucardo kid died in Fernandez Arias's arms within seven minutes. And to date, the Bucardo remains extinct, its tissue suspended in ice, awaiting eventual reanimation. Now, you may have noticed that none of these resurrections was reliant on synthetic biology. Indeed, they demonstrate the long-standing relationship of biotechnology to agriculture and animal husbandry enterprises in general. Neither are technologies like somatic cell nuclear transfer limited to endangered wildlife. Indeed, in many cases, reproductive technologies that were first developed in agriculture and zoology have later been appropriated for human reproductive technologies. What I mean by that is these technologies are transferred from zoos to fertility clinics. But the difference in where synthetic biologists now come into the story is that synthetic biologists want to aid in de-extinction efforts in which either whole frozen cells or nuclei cannot be recovered from live animals or from any animal carcasses, either because they're too old or too deteriorated. So um, if we were before talking about somatic cell nuclear transfer for organisms like somewhere around here, where there is some tissue that's viable, now we're gonna talk about um, degraded DNA over here. So trying to, well, I'll tell you what they're doing in a minute. But the point is there aren't any uh, whole cells left over. And you'll notice over here, there is no DNA. This is why Jurassic Park is not going to happen. Okay, <clears throat> so in cases such as these, where there are no live uh, or frozen cells, synthetic biologists can offer their services sequencing small snippets of degraded DNA. They then plan to use DNA synthesis technology to make new fragments of the same genetic material and stitch them back together. They hope to then port chunks of this new synthesized DNA from either endangered or extinct species into the whole genomes of living close relatives, which would then yield a biological chimera. Now, I first learned about the de-extinction project, the venture in which synthetic biologists team up with conservation biologists and ecologists in hopes of reviving extinct creatures, while speaking with synthetic biologist George Church in, the office, um, in his office at the Harvard Medical School. For over a decade now, Church's lab has accelerated DNA sequencing and synthesis, and uh, you're probably familiar with him because he most recently made news by using some very new uh, DNA synthesis technology on um, human embryonic stem cells. <clears throat> 
So what Church does is he employs high throughput genomic analysis and synthesis in projects such as his personal genome project, which is currently sequencing 100,000 human genomes and posting them online alongside individuals' medical histories and records. And if you're curious as to why he's doing that, you can ask me about it later. Um, just to pique your interest, it involves Obama and a waffle. Now, Church is not alone in his efforts. He has garnered a lot of press, however, um, because his proposals are very extreme and very mediagenic. And foremost among these is his plan to resurrect a woolly mammoth. So fast forward now to May of 2013, when conservation biologists met with synthetic biologists at a conference in Washington, DC, to hash out how and whether DNA synthesis should be used to revive extinct species. Attending the event on Church's invitation, I first noted the slick production values. It was hosted by both National Geographic and the now ubiquitous TED brand of conferences, which I'm assuming I don't need to explain. Everyone's seen a TED talk. And I noted that there were more reporters and television crews crowding the periphery of the room than there were scientists populating the amphitheater's seats. And nudely, Brian Eno and David Byrne music was providing a soundtrack in between these publicity-friendly 15-minute lectures that were being given by zoologists, paleoecologists, molecular paleontologists, and synthetic biologists. That day, each scientist who took the stage promised that massively parallel DNA synthesis of the sort developed in George Church's laboratory made resurrecting extinct species not merely a possibility, but an inevitability, one that would be achievable in the next decade. Now, before I continue, I want to just quickly describe the technology that could make possible such a de-extinction project. Uh, and this starts with the work of George Church and fellow synthetic biologist Peter Carr, who together developed and patented a technique called multiplex automated genome engineering, or MAGE. You don't need to remember this, and you don't really need to know what it means, um, because the details of MAGE aren't important for my purposes today. Really simply, it was a synthesis method that allowed synthetic biologists to produce billions of genetic variants, ranging from a few nucleotides to entire genes in just a few hours' time. So you could make a lot of changes into a genome in an afternoon's work. Uh, at the time, they touted MAGE as one of a series of what's called next-generation synthesis technologies that would vastly accelerate DNA synthesis and genome-level engineering at a relatively low cost. Um, and by low cost, I would say it's uh, well, at least at the time in 2013, it was on the order of a couple thousand dollars per genome. Now, since then, if you've been reading the news, you probably already know that MAGE has been overtaken by a new technology called CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, and I have a diagram here uh, that you don't really need to understand other than to know that on the left side, you see um, an image of what actually happens inside of uh, naturally occurring cells, and on the right is how scientists intend to use it. Basically, CRISPR-Cas9 is a um, really profoundly powerful gene editing technology that in the last three years has completely changed the landscape of biotechnology. What it does is it allows biotechnologists to do things like modify crops, but also to make germline edits in a number of different kinds of tissues, including human tissues. And the reason why that's so important is that those kinds of edits would then make changes that are heritable across generations. You're not just changing an organism, you're changing a germline that will continue for the next generation, the next one ad infinitum. So one application that Church proposes using for such uh, next generation synthesis technologies is to rapidly introduce multiple genes from extinct species into their closest living relatives. Foremost in his mind, as I mentioned, is resurrecting woolly mammoths and Neanderthals, whose genomes would be overlaid onto and whose embryos would be gestated in the wombs of elephants and humans, respectively. And I have no idea why I just said respectively. Obviously, the woolly mammoth would go in the elephant and the Neanderthal would go in the human. The reverse would be a terrible idea. Um, not to say that this is not a terrible idea, um, but... 
in January of 2013, the media blasted Church after Der Spiegel publicized a quotation from his recent book, Regenesis, in which he bragged that DNA synthesis had progressed to a point at which it was technically feasible to clone a Neanderthal. And as Church wrote in his book, he merely needs, and this is a quote, an adventurous human female to serve as his surrogate. He later dialed back his statement, citing an error in translation from English to German. And without commenting on that, all I will say is that the news went viral. Now, all of this left me somewhat confused, and not just the human Neanderthal surrogate thing. Um, for years, I had observed and talked to synthetic biologists about the notion that making new life forms would help them to better understand how life works. But where does de-extinction fit into that project? Right? What is to be gained from reviving creatures that have already lived and died? And most synthetic biologists say they seek to make better forms of life. Indeed, one of the central questions I posed when I began research for this book was what exactly it was they meant when they said better. So to what end would they resurrect those species that one might say had already failed at the evolutionary game, right? Organisms that disappeared from the planet as victims of changing climactic conditions or predation. This is a big question, and I think another story will help answer a bit of it by putting a finer point on the problem of how species is defined. In particular, the story I'm going to tell messes a bit with the ways in which biologists even define speciation as the product of evolution and natural selection. Selective backbreeding is a sort of artificial selection that plays out in reverse. Really simply, researchers begin by aiming to make a modern species, or sorry, to take a modern species like a cow and then gradually transform it back in time into an extinct ancestral species. So looking at drawings and illustrations of, for example, primitive cattle breeds, they attempt to introduce all of the characteristics of an extinct breed into successive generations of living cattle. Henry Kirkdyke Otten, who is the curator of the prehistoric megafauna fossil collection at the World Museum of Man, which is a really cool title for a job, uh, is on a singular mission to revive a wild prehistoric bovine named the Oroch. The last Oroch died in Poland in the 17th century. But working with old cattle breeds, Kirkdyke Otten and his colleagues now slowly breed cattle so that over the course of multiple generations, the cattle begin to sport all the characteristics of what Kirkdyke Otten terms an original auroch. They look just like, at least, the pictures we have of aurochs. So this method involves artificially inseminating bison to create crossbred Holstein cattle, uh, and then slowly trying to backbreed them until they eventually create a herd of heretofore extinct aurochs. There's not yet a herd of aurochs, but they're working on it. And Kirkdyke Otten hopes to introduce these new aurochs into areas in which aurochs once roamed, about which I'll say more soon. But first, what does he mean by original? Or for that matter, what does he mean by auroch? At the end of Kirkdyke Otten's presentation, Stuart Brand, uh, the guy who actually did kind of invent the internet, um, he was serving as master of ceremonies that day at the conference, and he took the stage to ask Kirkdyke Otten a very pointed question. And he said, how do you know from backbreeding when you're finished? When do you know that you have an auroch? So rephrasing Brand's question, what makes an auroch an auroch rather than just a Holstein-Bison hybrid that if you squint just so, looks sort of like a prehistoric bovine? Kirkdyke Otten's answer was revealing because he assumed that species is not a biological type grounded in successive generations sharing common lineage, which is often how we tend to think about what a species is. He said, well, instead of just taking an end product, 
we are gradually transforming an animal into an original, which is just kicking the can down the road, right? An original what? Um, and Brand continued to press the issue, and he sardonically asked as he left the stage, as Kirkdike Auden left the stage, is a new passenger pigeon a real passenger pigeon, or are they proxies, fakes, or theater props? So too, a popular science article reporting on de-extinction featured an artist's rendering of a passenger pigeon taking flight with the image captioned, if it looks and flocks like a passenger pigeon, is it a passenger pigeon? Elsewhere, the same author asked, even if Church and his colleagues managed to retrofit every passenger pigeon specific trait into a rock pigeon, rock pigeons being the pigeons that you see all the time in urban areas, right? So you retrofit every part of the passenger pigeon back into the rock pigeon, would the resulting creature truly be a passenger pigeon or just an engineered curiosity? Okay, so here I wanna slow down a bit. Of course, species has been a problematic category for life scientists for a long time. I could start with Linnaeus, but instead I'll just say uh, as an example, when readers of Darwin uh, read on the origin of species, uh, they realized that if Darwin was right, then species were no longer God-given facts, but rather judgments made by a taxonomist. And here I'm paraphrasing from an excellent book uh, called Keywords in Evolutionary Biology. The definition of species that's most often used as a shorthand in biology today was first articulated by evolutionary biologist Ernst Meyer in 1942. He defined species as a reproductively isolated and compatible natural population, right? That means that for something to be a species, it has to be able to reproduce with, like, with other members of that species, but not with things that aren't in the species, okay? That being said, there are now multiple competing and overlapping biological definitions of species, about 53 last time I checked. And these definitions vary between evolutionary and taxonomic criteria, sexually and asexually reproducing species, right? How do you even talk about species if it's defined as reproductively isolated, but it reproduces asexually? That doesn't make any sense. Um, and even definitions that are specific to biological subdisciplines. What I mean by that is if you ask an ornithologist what a species is, she'll tell you something very different than what would happen if you asked a botanist what a species is. So these disputes already clue us into the fact that species is unstable. It's not a naturally defined category. And what I mean is this, Darwinian natural selection privileges genealogy, as we know, as the marker of a species. 20th century molecular biology translates genealogy into genetics. But de-extinction could turn definitions of species on their heads. It could compromise shared evolutionary history as a ground for taxonomy by reviving physiology and behavior as principles on which to judge sameness. That is, to borrow the language of my interlocutors, an animal that looks and flocks like a passenger pigeon, for these researchers, is a passenger pigeon, even if it has lots of rock pigeon DNA inside of it and is taught to flock by rock pigeons. Environmental historians remind us that the classification of animals, like that of any group of significant objects, is apt to tell as much about the classifiers as about the classified. Here I'm quoting from Harriet Ritvo's brilliant book, The Platypus and the Mermaid. The question of whether a genetic chimera counts as real reveals that for de-extinction scientists, purity of phenotype, that is morphology or behavior, trumps genetics and lineage. Indeed, since the advent of genetic sequencing, species has been defined by shared genes rather than morphology. If you go back, say, to Linnaeus, it wasn't about genes. Obviously, it was about morphology, among other things. So, a theory of species that relies on morphology means basically the notion that creatures that look alike are alike. Yet DNA synthesis promises to compose hybrid genomes 
that mash up elephants and woolly mammoths, modern humans and Neanderthals. And what I was um, aiming to draw your attention toward in this slide is uh, exactly how they're planning to make a woolly mammoth by um, building a hybrid genome that includes uh, mostly African elephant DNA. And I'll say more about that in a moment. So in so doing, de-extinction uncouples genetic from morphological definitions of species. And this renders species identity problematic. There is no there there. What counts as real or original no longer makes any genetic, genealogical, or historical sense. Conservation biologist Kent Redford enunciated the ways in which DNA synthesis and interspecies surrogacy trouble species boundaries. At the front of the conference auditorium, he baldly stated that species conservation reflects, as he put it, an overarching human desire to make categories while making things that override those categories. As examples of such thinking, he described bison conservation efforts in uh, the last century. Now, ranchers trying to breed bison that needed less water and could survive harsh winters in the United States have long bred bison cattle hybrids. Um, so that's a cattle uh, It's actually a buffalo cow, not a bison cow. Um, I couldn't find a cartoon for the bison cow. I apologize. Um, so these animals look just like bison, but they have a lot of cattle genes in them. However, when the Bison Society began restoring bison to American nature preserves in the 1970s, the society refused releasing bison that were, as they put it, tainted by cattle genes. At that point, there weren't any bison that weren't tainted by cattle genes, so I'm not really sure what they wanted to release. But back to Redford. What does it matter, Redford asked, no species is ever pure. Modern dogs bear wolf genes, although um, given this image, it's hard to believe. <laughs> Humans are well stocked with Neanderthal genes and Denisovan genes, among other things. And as Redford put it, purity isn't found in nature, in species. When we ask why things aren't pure, we should be looking in the mirror at ourselves. His point was that the genetic level, species always commingle. Extending his observation, I would submit that synthetic biologists, in seeking to resurrect extinct species, must first contend with the very notion of species as something that was never isolable, pristine, or static, ever, in the first place. So in the absence of genetic homogeneity, synthetic biologists are reviving old ideas about taxonomy as a proxy for evolutionary definitions that rely on genetic sameness. What I'm saying here is that the ways in which we define species are now going backwards instead of forwards. There is no such thing as forwards, but the point is we're no longer focusing primarily on genetics. So organisms that look and behave like an auroch or a wolf or a bison or a passenger pigeon or a human are simply getting coded as such. Now, this issue is a live one for George Church's efforts to resurrect the woolly mammoth. Rather than working with the entirety of a woolly mammoth genome, which is very hard to come by, Church proposes hybrid genome reconstruction. So the idea is as follows. The remains of woolly mammoths, that most charismatic of Pleistocene megafauna, are frozen in permafrost across the Siberian tundra. This is just one example. Now, Beth Shapiro is one of many biologists whose job it is to collect mammoth carcasses in the Arctic, and she's written a book about it. She gathers mammoth teeth, bones, and hair, and even massive heads bearing tusks and encasing ancient brains. Frozen tissue preserves DNA, even as bacteria slowly metabolize and fragment it. Remember I mentioned that Jurassic Park wasn't going to happen? That's because of this kind of slow degradation. We can get bits of mammoth, we can't get bits of dinosaur. So working backward from frozen mammoth tissue, paleontologists collected either in the Arctic or in gold mining sites in Alaska 
biologists are now compiling sequences of mammoth DNA. The first such sequence was published um, in the journal Nature in 2008, and it was the concerted effort of scientists from around the world at Penn State, at the Severtsov Institute, the Russian Academy of Sciences, UC Santa Cruz, and the Broad here in Cambridge. And if you read this article, uh, what it reports on is that hair samples from two woolly mammoths that had been frozen in permafrost for 20,000 years yielded 4.17 billion base pairs of genetic sequence. The researchers who presented in DC proposed using DNA sequencing to compile fragments of mammoth DNA from those tissues that were found in permafrost. Right, so they would take all of these little chunks and they would then stitch together the genetic fragments until they could compose the full complement of a mammoth genome. They would then right, not take the entirety of the mammoth genome, but instead compare the mammoth genome to the mammoth's closest living relative, which is the Asian elephant, and synthesize those portions of mammoth DNA that are not shared by both species. They would then uh, use DNA synthesis to paste those fragments into the elephant genome, right? So taking out the woolly mammoth genes that aren't shared with the elephant and putting them into the elephant genome. In particular, they want to insert genes that would change the hair color of the Asian elephant, increase its uh, hair density, amp up its subcutaneous fat. It is going to be living in the tundra after all. Uh, as well as its sebaceous glands and uh, a gene to increase, or actually a suite of genes, to increase its tusk length. So note that the majority of the genome would be elephant genome, with a few key genes coding for mammoth physiognomy mixed in. The next step, somatic cell nuclear transfer, as we already talked about, would allow Church and colleagues to artificially fertilize an egg, insert this hybrid mammoth elephant genome into an elephant egg cell uh, using microinjection. Now we're basically back to the same technology that made Dolly the sheep, and then induce it to divide with a small electric current to fuse the cell. Again, this cell would need to divide and reach the blastocyst stage um, in order to differentiate, and then once the animal became an embryo, um, it would have to be introduced into the uterus of a surrogate elephant to bring it to term. And realize uh, it's very important to note that in a lot of these projects there are multiple failures, right? So when I say there were 44 surrogates for the Bucardo but only one was brought to term, um, there were hundreds of experiments before Dolly the Sheep was born, um, this work isn't a one-off thing. Lots and lots of uh, efforts have to be made before you can actually bring an organism to term. Um, uh, a somatic cell nuclear tra transfer organism to term other uh, less synthetic things are easier to pull off. Okay, so um, right now the the embryo is in an elephant, and um, Shapiro, Beth Shapiro, reminds the audience that this wouldn't be easy even at this stage because mammoths were much larger than modern day elephants. And on that note, one skeptical biologist in the audience asked a question that uh, no doubt many of us were thinking, I certainly was thinking about it. Um, she was dubious as to who would serve as a surrogate for a gestating woolly mammoth. And this biologist pointed out that woolly mammoths, again, are much larger than Asian or African elephants, and she was really concerned about this surrogate elephant, this proposed surrogate elephant, um, saying that she would probably be painfully miserable uh, or even endangered during the 22-month gestation period during which uh, she would need to bring a massive mammoth fetus to term. But we're not there yet. So while much of the mammoth genome has already been sequenced as of 2008, the rest of the project still remains speculative and prone to some starry-eyed Jurassic Park scenarios. Kirkdyke Otten fantasizes about building an ecotourist destination that would be similar to the safaris of the African Serengeti, a wildlife park he names the Danube Delta. He imagines herds of wild buffalo, horses, and red deer roaming free across the alluvial plains and wetlands of Romania and Ukraine. 
Another evolutionary biologist nominated large swaths of Yakutsk in Sakha Republic, which is, uh, as you can see, first of all, one of the coldest places to live, but up here in Siberia, uh, as an appropriate habitat for the resurrected mammoths. Uh, and as he declared, um, and this is a quote, the boy in me wants to see these animals walk across the permafrost. And uh, for his part, as George Church told me privately in conversation, he hopes resurrecting the woolly mammoth will alleviate some of the effects of anthropogenic climate change. Now this is a bold and kind of Rube Goldberg-esque statement that I'll explain uh, more shortly. But this idea of repopulating Yakutsk was first promoted by Sergei Zimov, a geophysicist from Vladivostok who currently directs the Northeast Science Station in Sakha Republic. In 1989, Zimov proposed restoring Pleistocene ecosystems. And he focuses his efforts on the stretch of land that once spanned uh, France, Canada, the Bering Strait, northeastern Siberia, and northern China for over a million years during the Pleistocene, but which disappeared tens of thousands of years ago. In Siberia, Zimov writes, and this was a, a quote from his article in Science, believe it or not, mammoths, woolly rhinoceroses, bison, horses, reindeer, musk, oxen, elk, moose, saiga, and yaks grazed on grasslands under the predatory gaze of cave lions and wolves. And this is precisely what he wants to bring back to Yakutsk. In a subsection of his science essay titled The Future of the Past, Zimov reports on his efforts to restore this ancient ecosystem on 160 square kilometers of land in uh, the Republic of Yakutia or Sakha Republic. Many mammals that walked, tramped, hopped, or galloped alongside the woolly mammoth remain in Sakha Republic. And in his talk, Zimov announced his plans to reintroduce bison as well as Siberian tigers to the land. And then Church hopes, once the Siberian tigers appear, uh, to also repopulate Yakutsk with herds of resurrected woolly mammoths. <clears throat> now I should mention uh, that Sakha Republic is home to nearly a million people uh, half of whom are indigenous Yakuts, and I am curious as to what they think about the possibility of living with Siberian tigers and woolly mammoths, uh, although no one has asked them. <laughs> now, in a Michael Crichton-esque flourish, the resulting ecosystem, which already exists minus the mammoths and the tigers, is named Pleistocene Park. Large stores of carbon are sequestered in the Arctic permafrost, which is released into the environment as the tundra melts. And what Church imagines is that herds of woolly mammoths roaming the Arctic tundra will trample the winter snow to maintain the Arctic permafrost with their massive hooves. And in so doing, will fend off soil erosion and maintain global temperatures. Like I said, Rube Goldberg-esque. So we need to bring back the woolly mammoth in order to stop or solve uh, anthropogenic climate change. Um, and as he describes Pleistocene Park, it would be the closest thing to time travel, a return to the flora and fauna of the Pleistocene epoch, a sort of latter-day Siberian Eden. I'm glad that got laughs. laughs. At the heart of each of these stories is a fantasy of resurrecting the past. Biologists imagine raising extinct animals from the dead, looking skyward to see the sun eclipsed by millions of swooping passenger pigeons, or even putting a collar and leash on the descendant of an animal who, the last of his kind, paced frantically in a Tasmanian zoo 80 years ago. And I, I'm not making this up, um, this is a uh, Siberian, a tiger called the thylacine, and people do want them as pets. In teaming up with conservation biologists, synthetic biologists seek to span million-year gaps in biological history. They aspire to effectively rewind evolution to extract species from the times in which they grew and flourished and waned and died. <clears throat> 
only to then have new synthetic life breathed into them again. In so doing, what counts as a species must necessarily be redefined. Synthetic biologists shore up species as a concept grounded in genetic notions of purity, origin, and identity, even as interspecies surrogacy and hybrid synthesis technologies privilege morphological and behavioral verisimilitude above genetic exactitude. So if synthetic biologists seek to better understand life through its reconstruction, as I've argued, then de-extinction promises to reconstruct a very different kind of life. The object of synthetic biology here is making new sorts of life that dispense with any meaningful ground for what is biological or natural in favor of organisms and spaces that merely appear as if natural. So to conclude, what then becomes of species? The extinction efforts do not simply pause, reverse, or restart biological time. Rather, de-extinction graphs the past, that is, species whose time has already run out, and the past imperfect, rare or endangered species, onto the present, so species filling in as surrogates for rare animals, in order to then capacitate future life forms. I read synthetic biologists' resurrection and de-extinction projects as fantasies of ultimate biological control. Their interventions seek to produce wholly synthetic creatures that will stand in counterintuitively as semblances of untouched nature. They hope to fashion a latter-day Garden of Eden seemingly unsullied by human hands, albeit generated by the most recent bioengineering technologies. Biological manipulation and modification now serves as a benchmark of biological mastery and operates as a tool with which synthetic biologists seek to study life. And as such, de-extinction efforts push the boundaries of what will in the future count as both life and species. Thank you.